to uh, come on now. And uh, I'm presuming you can hear me. So um, let's kind of begin. So very warm welcome to everyone. Thanks very much for tuning in, whoever is here and there. And uh, as you know, my name's Mike, Mike George. I have the honor of being uh, being your speaker this evening. I would have much preferred to have um, I uh, jumped on a plane and come your way as was originally planned, but uh, as we know, 2020 is turning out to be a challenging year for everyone. So here I am online on screen. So probably a little bit about me, just to kind of um, uh, introduce myself. And, and I guess the reason I'm sitting here talking to you now is about 35 years ago, I woke up one day and um, realized I was not very relaxed as an individual. In fact, I hadn't even discovered any level of relaxation, never mind the four levels of relaxation. <laughs> and uh, it kind of crept up on me very slowly over many years, and I just suddenly began to realize I need to do something different in my life. But I wasn't sure what. I wasn't sure how, and I wasn't sure where or when. So I gave up what I was doing and uh, began to look around and looked outside and inside and to see what I had to change. And then very quickly, I kind of realized the one thing no one ever teaches us, it's the big hole in all our educations, and it's called self-understanding. And uh, I began the, the journey, if you like, and it's a necessary journey for us all to um, cultivate this thing called self-understanding and uh, and I, I kind of very quickly realized that um, uh, you know the real school in life is, is not in school or university or college but is um, within my consciousness and it's this is the the true school this is where we do our our thinking it's where we create our visions, make our decisions, do our learning, do our unlearning. And so um, I kind of went back to school, uh, except the school wasn't external, the school was internal. And that's where I've been ever since. And that's where I'll be for the rest of my life. So to cut a long story short, about um, three, four years later, I started doing what I've been doing for about 20 years now, 30 years, I would say, coaching, teaching, training, writing, lecturing, I have about 16 books out around this kind of subject area. In other words, um, the area to do with self-understanding, self-awareness, self-management. And the purpose this evening is to kind of take you on a little bit of a journey and uh, explore what, what I've kind of come to call the four main levels. Not the only levels, but the four main levels of, um, of relaxation. And um, it's probably useful just to start to, to articulate what those levels are um, for me. And, and you may, you may uh, differ in your perspective. And if you do, and if you do have any questions, then please feel free to add them to the, the chat page as we go along. Uh, there will be time at the end, I'm sure, where we'll be able to um, explore any kind of areas or issues which are not clear. In, uh, in any explanations that I make. But the four levels essentially that we're all challenged now to, to manage even more than before, simply because of what's happened during this year is the physical level, the mental level, the emotional level, and then what I call the level of the heart, which is really the self, the true heart. We have two hearts, we have one in our body, and then the heart of our consciousness, which is really me moi, as they say in a certain language. Um, and so obviously there's so much material out there now which can help you with the physical level and, and to get this balance right. And of course this is the, the balance of rest, relaxation, diet and exercise. Rest, relaxation, they're quite different. You know, resting is, is just resting and consciously relaxing is, uh, is essential and, and sometimes we go on holiday to do that, although that's not obviously sometimes the best way to relax in our life. 
um, to sleep well, to have a good evening sleep, and then to be careful with our diet. And so everybody's going to be so different in, in how they bring these four corners at a physical level together, four corners of our life. And some people, they need a lot of sleep and they don't need to, to relax too much. Other people need to relax a lot, have to be very careful with their diet. Other people need to sleep a little. And so everyone has to find their own optimum amount and content of each one of those four areas. And as we do, as we experiment, and, and that experimentation can be over a period of time for many people, we, we, we then find it easier to... To, to be the managers of our physical energy, to be the conscious managers of our physical energy. And it's a little bit like um, the, the driver and the car, you know, the, the driver takes care of the car, you know, it puts in the right fuel, the right oil, has the servicing done, uh, gives the car a rest sometimes. And so it's a little bit like that, is that our body is, is something we need to take care of to give it the right fuel, to, to look after it, to maintain it. Uh, service is obviously not the best metaphor, but sometimes taking it somewhere for a different atmosphere, different environment, that can help to relax things at a physical level. And so everyone needs to find their own, their own balance between these four areas. And there's tons of material, tons of books, tons of articles, tons of seminars, workshops, online, offline, inline, every line and, and, and you can consume any one of those at any time. And uh, I, I, of course, I'm not going to be able to relax my body uh, and to relax at a physical level, unless of course, I'm able to relax at a mental level because of this relationship between mind and body, which we all kind of know about now. You know, if you're worried in your thoughts, if you're tense in your thinking, if you're, if you're anxious in your mind, then it's going to show up in your body, the psychosomatic effect. Yeah, and so that's why we've got so many, so many people now talking about the mind, how to understand the mind a little bit better. And, and of course, there's this whole sort of area of how to change your thinking. You shouldn't be thinking so negatively. It's your negative thoughts that are going to cause your physical disease. And so you should be more positive. You should be thinking more positively. And so there's this tendency at a mental level to get caught in the tension between the negative and the positive, where it's really a little bit like an illusion in a sense. It's, it's, I, I've often challenged people to, to define what a negative thought is and just show me exactly where the negative becomes the positive. <laughs> and of course, they, they can't really. No one knows. Because I could be thinking very kind of apparently negative thoughts, but feeling quite positive. I could be feeling very negative, but thinking quite positive. And, and so this idea of negative and positive, it's a little bit of an illusion when it comes to our mind, our consciousness, if, if you like. And so it's necessary to really see where our thoughts are coming from, what the origin of their, those thoughts are. It's a little bit like if you, if you, if you notice you're, you're thinking very unrelaxed thoughts, oh, I've got to stop this kind of thinking. Uh, you, should, you shouldn't be thinking like this. And, and so it's like, it's like weeding the garden. You might be able to stop the thought or, or, or cut out that kind of thinking, but if I don't get to the root of the weed in the garden, the weed just grows again. And that's what happens for most of us. We think habitually. Yeah, and, and so that's because the root of the thought, the habit of thinking that way, is a little bit deeper in our consciousness. And we need to see that and change that and and so if we go a little bit deeper than our thought and notice where our thoughts are coming from within us they aren't coming from outside sure we can watch the news watch a movie we can listen to someone but of course as we consume their sounds their thoughts we create our own version yeah, and we create our own version according to our perception yeah, and according to how we perceive a situation. That's why so when someone, uh, two people go and see a movie, uh, they talk about the movie afterwards, and one person says, well, I didn't see that in the movie, and the other person says, well, I didn't see that in the movie. And so they were, were we watching the same movie? And, and of course, yes, they were. 
they were both watching the same movie, but they were creating, perceiving their own version. Yeah, and, and, and so they were thinking about creating thoughts about the movie in their own consciousness, but they were different thoughts because they had different perceptions. I'm sure you understand what perception is. It's that glass half full, half empty. Some people see the glass half empty. Oh my God, the water's running out. Some people see it half full. Ah, no problem. There's plenty of water. And so your perception is really how you interpret the world. And so if we just dig a little bit deeper, we notice our perception is shaped. It's not rocket science by our beliefs. You know, the beliefs that we have assimilated from mums and dads and parents and teachers, the beliefs that we've assimilated from our culture, the beliefs that we've assimilated from our, our entertainment mediums, our, 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 the advertising and the marketing around us, constantly trying to make us create and hold on to a set of beliefs about other people, about the world, about everything really. And this is the root of our thinking. This is where our thoughts are coming from. And, and, and if I have unrelaxed thoughts, then some people, they call those negative thoughts. And for me, I, I, I want to get rid of this negative, positive toing and froing and, and the tension of being lost between the two. And should I think less negative, more positive? No, I want to get to the root of where the thought is coming from. And, and, and that's, that's my beliefs. And it's, it took me a while to see this. And um, it's necessary to sit quietly and go inside and see what it is that's giving rise to a particular set of thoughts that's making me unrelaxed. Yeah, so, so the, the, the first belief that we all have to jump over, get over, realize is not true, is this idea, belief basically, that the other person is making me feel unrelaxed, that the situation or the government or the weather is making me feel unrelaxed, you know, tense, worried or whatever. And of course, that belief is predominant throughout the entire world. Everyone ha has to go through a process, for me, of realizing that belief is not true. Yeah. <laughs> Until you see that belief is not true, that it's not them, it's always me, then you're going to get stuck. And this is why most people are stuck in the blame game, the complain game, the criticism game, the judgment game, the projection game. All these games we play because we're carrying this belief that's giving rise to these thoughts that other people are responsible. Now, of course, belief is not the truth, as again, they don't teach us this in school. Um, belief is not the truth. Belief is an idea that I've, I've, I've grasped from somewhere, somewhere in the past, and I'm holding on to it. And I'm allowing that to shape how I think and maybe even act. But it's not the truth. Yeah, <laughs> the truth about belief is in the word belief, in English anyway. I'm not sure about it, Italian or French or, or Spanish. But in English, belief is spelled B-E-L-I-E-F. So when you're holding on to a belief, you are lying to yourself. The being, B, is lying to itself. Yeah, it's not that the content of the belief is 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 wrong but in the case of this idea of responsibility who's responsible for my thoughts and feelings yeah the content is inaccurate yeah it's not true and so i am lying to myself but i'm not aware of it because i just keep going that makes me feel and they make me think and they make me do that, they make me do that and so we, we get into that habit and that habit of projecting becomes like a comfort zone even though we're uncomfortable we we become comfort comfortable in our uncomfortable uncomfortableness. <laughs> so the truth is, it's not them, it's me. And so if you can get this, if you can get the penny to drop, if you can realize this deeper truth prior to the learned belief, then you'll begin to taste what's called your freedom. In other words, the freedom, let's just take one example, the freedom from feeling like a victim. Yeah, because this is what most people, when they're complaining or blaming or projecting, they're saying, I'm the victim. 
And so they suffer from this disease called victimitis. And that's very unrelaxing. And so this disease will disappear as soon as you realize the truth and take responsibility for your world, your life, your consciousness, basically. <laughs> so this is just one belief. And, and there's many beliefs, many beliefs. Another one, a favorite of parents, I think, and managers in the workplace is the belief that they, they don't realize they're holding, but they've, they've learned it and, and, and it gives rise to expectation. And this is belief that I can control someone else. Yeah. That, that, that you should do what I say. You should do what I think. You are here to do what I tell you to do. And of course, parents are brilliant at that. Parents, what parents spend their life doing is controlling their, their children. And the child goes up, goes to work, and they start trying to control other people. Yeah, and so this belief is, is kind of very deeply embedded in our consciousness. And it makes us think in very unrelaxed ways when people don't do what I want. Yeah. <laughs> I make myself, because remember it's not someone else that's making me, I make myself very unrelaxed when people don't do what I want or what I say or what I think should happen here. And if we look underneath that belief, you know, there's a, a deeper level still, and it's this idea that, um, that uh, it's only when other people do what I want or when the situation is the way I want or when things happen the way I want that I can be happy, <laughs> that I can be okay in myself. And we get trapped in this belief system in our consciousness. And that's what's making us think in very unrelaxed ways when the world does not dance to my tune. I, I, my, one of my favorite cartoons is, is, the, is the husband and the wife, they're meeting together, this little bubble above their heads. And, so, and they're both thinking the same thing and saying the same thing. And they're both saying, but you are with me to make me happy. <laughs> so they're both saying that to each other. <laughs> so they're both trapped in this idea that other people, that they are designed to make me happy. And so when they don't do what I want, I become very unhappy. When I believe that they are here to make me happy, I create expectation. And, and expectation is, is kind of like the downfall of, or the first sign of the downfall of many a relationship, basically. It's not a, a healthy thing to create in my consciousness. So we have many, um, we have many beliefs that we've all absorbed, we're all absorbing, we're all affirming in our conversations with each other, especially around the subject of love. You know, this, this idea that, that I have to find love out there somewhere comes from the belief that love is acquired, that I have to acquire love. And of course, everyone um, is thinking that, that, that I've got to find, I, it's required. I have to, I have to, my life is about, it's about finding love in my life, for my life, for me. And so we go outside looking for someone who will love us. And so we believe, we learn to believe that love comes from outside in. But of course, the truth, I'm sure you're familiar with the truth, especially if you've kind of heard me before, is that it's, um, it's not, it's not an energy that I need to acquire. It's, it's an energy that I already am. It's like love is a word that describes the highest level of consciousness. It leads to the intention to give of myself, to, to be selfless in my giving. It leads to that intention. Yeah. But of course, we've absorbed a belief that's pulled that vibration down. And that belief is that I've got to find love. I've got to get someone who's going to love me. Love has got to come from outside in. And so we get trapped in the search in, in life for the, the perfect partner, the perfect source, the love of my life. And, and, and we seem, that seems to be right because other people are all doing it too. In fact, the two great teachers have, have taught us since we were children, Hollywood and Bollywood, everything they create, well, not everything, but almost everything is about acquiring you know, because it's required to spend your life looking for love. But the truth is, it is what I am. 
And so it's, it's to be discovered inside. But as long as I don't discover it, I'll always be living in this anxiousness, you know. When will I find the one for me? Who will it be? And why don't they love me? And why don't you love me more? Why don't you give me your attention? Why don't you? I'm crying inside. And so we create this suffering for ourselves because we're holding on to a belief which is not true. Yeah, which is not the truth. And this is what, I don't know about you, but this is what I'm interested in and have been for, for actually almost 40 years now is to get to the truth of things. Yeah, to get this revealed in my own consciousness so that I can think accurately. You know, I can act accurately according to that truth, if that makes sense, and not according to a belief that I've learned or assimilated on my journey so far. So this, this idea of, of rediscovering what is true is the road, the pathway to the relaxation of the mind. And when you go down that road, when you, um, when you explore for yourself and begin to see this for yourself, then, then you'll bump into the third level. The, the, it's, it's, like, it's, not, it's not a question of depth. It's, it's like a related to, to unrelaxed thinking will be a set of unrelaxing emotions. Yeah, and that those emotions which we create are not created by something outside or someone outside. These emotions are three main families, fear, anger, and, and, and sadness. And so whenever you're, you're feeling these emotions, in other words, creating and feeling these emotions, then you're, uh, you're in an unrelaxed state at an emotional level. Yeah, and the reason, if you look into it, then it's a little bit deeper still, the reason that these emotions occur in our consciousness you know, is, is our own attachment to something or someone or some memory. You know, it's, it, it, this is, this is the, the cause of all emotion is, is this idea of attachment. It's when the self, the I that says I am, the me, not what I see in the mirror, but the conscious me, is when I get attached to something or someone in my mind. Yeah, and, and we do this hundreds of times a day. It seems to be the natural thing to do. We're taught that it's the natural thing to do. And then we're taught that, that a little bit of fear, a little bit of anger, a little bit of sadness are natural emotions. They're human nature. You can't do anything about them. They'll always be there. Human nature, so don't bother. And we use that belief to not do anything about <laughs> our suffering due to our attachment. Yeah, so whenever you feel any fear, it's always you fear losing someone or something. It's always in the future. Whenever you feel the emotion of sadness, it's always because you believe you have lost something in the past. You know, reputation, an opportunity, money, an object, a person, it's because you believe you've lost. And of course, the fear in the future, and it might just be your imagination. You imagine you're going to lose something, and that's enough, to, if you notice, to, to generate anxiety, a very unrelaxed state in our consciousness, and then that floods into the body. And then anger, of course, is when you look for someone to blame for your loss in the past or your imagined loss in the future. And sometimes it's just all in our imagination. Yeah. And so... This is why they, they, they have this, this, this saying that, you know, that we don't have possessions, our possessions have us. Yeah, and, and you know you possess something as soon as you start thinking and saying, that's mine, they're mine. This is mine, my family, my job, my money. Yeah, as soon as you start, start indulging in mindedness <laughs> in saying that's mine, then you're, you're saying, I possess that person i possess this i know you don't think i possess and i don't you don't intend maybe but really that's what you're saying they're in my consciousness and it, i'm calling it mine i mean my one of my favorite examples is when you get the new carpet the new carpet arrives and you oh i'm so happy with the new carpet it's lovely isn't this new carpet lovely darling isn't this great and then the guest comes for dinner they walk across the carpet 
cup of coffee in hand and you can see the coffee going over in slow motion. Oh my God, the coffee's going to hit the carpet. Oh my God, why it's in my carpet. You've ruined my carpet. And so we become very emotionally upset. Now, why? Because the carpet's in two places. My carpet's in two places. It's outside on the floor, of course, in the lounge, but it's also in my mind. It's an image in my mind. And I lose my sense of who I am, my sense of self, in the image on my mind. That's why when you stay in the carpet outside, I take it personally. That's what emotion is a sign of. I'm taking it personally on the inside. Yeah, and that's that's called attachment. That's where attachment happens. It's no, um, it's not rocket science. It's not right. It's not wrong. It's not good. It's not bad. It's just a mistake we've all learned to make. Is to get attached, to lose our sense of self in what we are not. Yeah, and and this is where these emotions come from. So when you become emotional that you always if you can get this if you can really see this you'll begin to realize uh uh it's not the football match it's not what the person's saying it's not what they're doing it's not what's happening in the world out there that's making me fearful or angry or sad it's because i'm attached to something in my mind if you can make that connection then you'll begin to go oh, oh now what is it i'm attached to and what do i need to come out of and and this is the first practice to relax at an emotional level is is this practice of 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 detachment and just watching there's a there's a lovely saying and if there's anything you write down and take away from today and take this one saying is it all emotion dies under observation all emotion dies under observation so you experiment experiment with it try it and you'll see that this is true this this for me is a is a truth in other words when you're emotional when you're oh my god i'm so angry oh i'm so scared it's like you're caught in the middle of the disturbance it's like a little bit of a a whirlwind in your conscious a hurricane in your consciousness and if you detach from that and you begin to watch it you come to the center of the storm in your consciousness, the center of your emotional storm. And when you come to the center of the storm, you always find your peace. You always find your power. It's always there. And, and the emotion begins to subside. And, and, and of course, even naturally, you can't stay angry all the time. <laughs> you'll start laughing. If you try to, you'll start laughing after a while. You can't stay anxious all the time. Something will distract you and you'll get involved in something else and the anxiety will disappear. And so when you practice this idea of detaching and then just watching, then the emotion subsides. This is actually the first step of, of, of many meditation practices is the ability to stand back inside in your consciousness and just watch everything coming and going. People come and go, thoughts come and go, memories come and go, situations come and go. Everything comes to pass. Everything comes to pass. You've maybe noticed this in your life. You don't have the same things, same money, same clothes, same people in your life you had 10, 12, 15 years ago. Everything comes to pass, except for one thing. <laughs> and of course, you know that what that one thing is, is it's me. The one is watching. Everything comes and go <laughs> and so oh wait a minute hold on a second now well who is that me well what is that me who is the observer and as soon as you start asking that question then you've begun what sometimes is called the spiritual journey or the journey of awakening or or realizing what is true you know so i'm not saying you you you're never, you should never feel emotional again. I'm not saying that. I'm not, I'm not saying it's good or it's bad. It's just the result of a mistake and, and, and mistakes can be corrected and that's what we're doing. So you're sitting in the meeting and, and you, you lose the plot, as they say, and you go, oh my God, oh, I do, I'm so angry at you. You might not show it, but you keep it inside. And so the next day in the meeting, you, you want to, to, to be able to be less emotional. So there's five little steps you can practice to, to just, just come out of the emotion. I don't know which one will be most effective for you, but there's five steps that you can practice. The first step is, is the idea of awareness. Oh, 
I'm, there's a, is irritation. I'm getting irritated at this person. And irritation is an early form of the emotion of anger. Irritation. Oh, oh I'm getting irritated. It's not the guy in car in front now. It's the second step is acknowledge. I'm responsible, not the guy in the car in front. It's not David in the meeting that's making me irritated. I acknowledge responsibility. So awareness and then acknowledge it. Take responsibility. And then the third stage is to accept. Aha, irritation. You're back again. I thought you'd gone and here you are again. Now you might be doing this just in your head. That's okay. Or it might, you've been doing it for five minutes last thing at night before you go to bed. It doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter where and when you do this. But these are five steps that will help you gradually not react emotionally. So the third step is accepting the presence of the, the irritation. Don't resist it. Don't, oh my, don't think I shouldn't be, I shouldn't be, I shouldn't be resistant. I shouldn't be angry. No, because that suppresses it. But accept its presence. Embrace it. Look at it. Yeah. And then fourth step is ascend. In other words, detach and just look at it and it will lose its power. It will lose its power. Yeah. And so ascending, you're already kind of doing a, the ascending, but in stage three, in the stage of acceptance. But then stage four is consciously ascending, just coming back to the center, coming away, detaching. And then stage five is to attune, to tune in, yeah, tune into the center where you find your peace, you find your power, which is always there in your consciousness. Yeah. So the fifth stage is attune. And they've been doing that in the East for thousands of years. Yeah. It's called meditation. <laughs> so if you learn to meditate, then this meditation is not something you just do sitting quietly alone in a room in a corner. It's something you can do anywhere, anytime, in the car, in that, well, not when you're driving, but uh, in the office, in the meeting. In, in other words, you center yourself, you ground yourself in your own peace, in your own power, which is always there at the heart of your consciousness. Yeah. So this is the five little stages you can, you can practice, which will help you to restore your relaxation at the level of your emotionality. Now, just one qualification on, on all of that is that maybe you're thinking this already, maybe you have this question already. It says, isn't, isn't love an emotion? <laughs> I'm gonna take my, my life in my hands here because I'm probably speaking to a lot of Italian people. <laughs> and I'm going to suggest, suggest, that's all I'm gonna do, is that love is not an emotion. Love is your natural state of being. It's a natural state. It's not an emotional state. It's a natural state. <laughs> and, and just to qualify that, is think about fear. Fear is the same energy as the energy of love. It's just your consciousness at a certain vibration, because that's where these emotions, these feelings of emotions that they originate in your consciousness, not in your body, not out there, but they originate in you. So fear, whenever you feel fear, know that it started out as love, as a higher vibration, but then it got filtered through something you're attached to in your mind. Yeah, it got filtered through, distorted by, into the vibration of fear the vibration we call fear. So fear is love distorted by attachment. So when you learn to be a little bit more detached, then you'll notice that you're much more stable, much more naturally loving, caring, if you want. If you want care is a better word than love. You're much more selfless in your giving. Yeah, but as soon as you become attached, then you start to close yourself around the attachment. And then you generate fear. <gasps> don't want to lose it. Oh, don't touch it. Oh, don't take it away. And so we become tense and anxious. Whether we close around money or the house or the clothes or what we do on a Saturday night or whatever. And so I'm becoming closed around that idea, that image. And that's distorting my natural state of consciousness from love, lovefulness, care, empathy, compassion. It's 
stops me from expressing that energy through my behavior and I get closed and I feel small and I become anxious, scared, if, 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 you, if you know what I mean. So you'll start to notice this in, in your, own, your own journey if you want to. If you want, maybe you don't want to, maybe you're actually quite comfortable being uncomfortable. You're quite enjoying your stress, at least you think you are, until, this is what most people do, they tolerate their unrelaxed state that they create. They tolerate it for as long as they can. <laughs> and, and then they go, oh, I've got to do something about this. I've got to change something. I don't know what it is, but that's, that's, how, that's what I was doing. So I tolerated it as long as I could. I tolerated the frustration and the anxiety and the, oh my God, this I'm so sad. I tolerated it as long as I could. And then it just got so intense and it lasted for so long, I had to do something about it. And that's what kind of started me on really understanding uh, these dynamics that I'm explaining to you now. So the fourth level of relaxation, and really it's the primary level in, in, in as much that is that you can't relax properly at these other four levels unless you get this fourth level, the deepest level, unless you get this, this accurate. And, 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 it, and it kind of revolves, if you're taking notes, you might want to write down these three questions. It involves the getting clear in your answer to these three questions. And I can talk about them all night, but, but it won't make much difference until you see for yourself. If I don't just believe what I'm saying, but see if you can see for yourself. Question one is the oldest question, which all the philosophers bumped into down through the ages and said, this is the big question, and, and it's not new. And it's three, three, three words, who am I? Who am I exactly? Second question, is what am I? <laughs> and the third question is why am I here? <laughs> so who am I? What am I? Why am I here? Yeah, and so these are the, I mean, they sound very simple questions um, just to, to, to utter them, but actually they take you into uh, very deep places within yourself, if you're interested. And of course, your research to, to find the answers to these questions doesn't have to be totally um, in your own consciousness. You've got to uh, consult other people. You know, you're reading wisdom. You're listening to the wisdom of others. Oh, YouTube is just full of, of people who are sharing their wisdom. And so it's going to take a little bit of time to discern now what's authentic, what's accurate, what's real, and what am I seeing within myself? And so I don't know if you're that interested to do that kind of inner work, but this is now the time to do it. This is what all of this, this incredible global shutdown is giving us the opportunity to do, to sit quietly and who am I exactly? What am I and, and why am I here? So as I say, I can answer these questions, but it, it won't make much difference until you see and know for yourself. Question one is this very simple idea. Life is two energies, the physical and the spiritual. What do we say? I'm a human being. There's a form and consciousness. There's matter and mind. There's body and soul. And so one is very tangible, physical, the form, yeah, the matter. You can touch it, feel it, burn it, drown it, cook it, eat it. Well, <laughs> maybe not cook it and eat it. It's very tangible. Whereas the energy of consciousness of the soul or of the self, whatever you want to call it, is very intangible. You, can, you can't see it. And that's why science has nothing to say about consciousness. It can't get it in a test tube, it can't poke at it. It can see from brain scans that the, the effect it has on the matter of the brain, but it can't actually see consciousness itself. And that's why science has nothing to say. It doesn't want to say anything. It doesn't want to even acknowledge the existence of the consciousness that I am. But you can be the scientist and you can prove it to yourself. Whenever you learn to meditate, whenever you sit quietly, your body has to be in the room, but you can leave the room in one second. Yeah, you, your body has to stay here, but you can leave one second. In fact, maybe some of you have gone already. <laughs> and then when you come back, you'll notice, well, well, how long was I away? I don't, I don't know how long I lost. I lost my awareness of time. 
and where did I go? I lost my awareness of space. So you went beyond time and space, but your body had to stay here. You know? And so in that moment, in that little experiment that you do within yourself, you prove to yourself that you are not just a physical form. You have one, but it's not what you are. So the problem is that, that we've learned to believe, oh, there's this key word again, to believe this is what I am. And so that's why when you go look in the bathroom in the morning, the bathroom mirror, you believe what you see is what you are. And that's where your stress begins. <laughs> that's where your unrelaxed state has its origin because you believe that's me. And what are the beliefs that come after that? Oh my God, it's decaying. There's more wrinkles, more gray hair. Oh my God, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. It's terrible. I'm fearing death. And so you notice your unrelaxed state is coming from these beliefs about yourself. But the good news is, <laughs> that's not you. Isn't that good news? <laughs> so you don't need to follow it with the actions, the most common actions um, in the bathroom in the morning. Oh my God, oh, I'm a, yes, looking nice today. Now I can face the world. No, you don't need to do all that. Because <laughs> that is to be under the influence of an illusion. Yeah, The illusion is that, this is what I am. Yeah. <laughs> so you can break that illusion and then really focus on yourself, the self, the spiritual conscious being that I am. Yeah. Now, the, the only way to really get to know that is to take away everything that you've learned to believe you are and then see what's left. And if you notice, if you do that, then it's kind of like a process of elimination. I'm not what I do, I'm not what I earn, I'm not, not my family, I'm not my nation, I'm not what I believe, I'm not the memories that I'm carrying, I'm not my story. Oh God, I'm not the objects in my life. All these things we, we've learned to use to define ourselves, to, to build an identity for ourselves out of what we're not. And, and that's, the, that's the way the world works at the moment. And so when you take away all those things and notice what's left, then you'll notice that, that who I am, I am no one. I'm nothing. Not nothing, but no thing. Yeah. And so, wow, I'm free. This is called freedom. I still have those things in my life, but I've changed my relationship with them. I don't use them. I don't misuse them to build my sense of who I am anymore. It doesn't matter. I am. I am. I'm the I that says I am. Everything after I am is not me. <laughs> so once again, don't believe me, but see if you can see this for yourself. This takes a little bit of practice to see for yourself. And then you see your own truth about yourself. What am I? What's the most natural state? The most natural state which we all seek. Everything we do is motivated. Uh, out there in the world, everything we do, everywhere we go, everyone we want to be with, everything we want to have is motivated by one thing, the great search for a state of happiness. <gasps> when they come into my life, I'll be happy. When I get this, I'll be happy. A new job, I'll be happy. The more money, I'll be happy. And of course, have you ever noticed that as soon as you search outside for happiness, you're guaranteed to make yourself unhappy. <laughs> agitated, unrelaxed. <gasps> when am I going to get more? And, oh, I don't want to lose this. And so you're going to be creating a very unrelaxing emotional state. And that's because the truth is it's already here. You know, you all know this, I'm sure. You know, happiness is an inside job. It has to come from inside out. And, and, and that happiness is sometimes called contentment. You know, it's the shift from the hedonic way of life you know when the hedonist is always looking for the next pleasure because they believe that's the only happiness when they're pleasured in other words stimulated whereas the shift into the eudonic life is the individual who's discovered that feelings of fulfillment and meaning only arise from inside when i give 
of myself, when I give to others selflessly. Yeah, and so they've discovered this sense of fulfillment and satisfaction and this deepest contentment within themselves only occurs when they give, them, give themselves away. And so this making this shift is not easy in a material world, in a world where we've learned to believe the only reality is out there, that everything is to be found outside ourselves. When we learn that belief, that makes us live according to the material paradigm. But the primary reality is our own consciousness. You know, it's, it's this huge world that we occupy within ourselves, the world within, not the world without the world within. And that's what's missing from human relationships today at, at every level. Yeah. <laughs> and so then the final question, why am I here? In other words, what's the purpose of life? You know, and, and, and the simplest answer is for me, this is just for me, you'll arrive at this in your own way, in your own time. Simplest answer for me is the purpose of life is to live. <laughs> is to live. But then that naturally gives rise to a curiosity, a kind of curiosity, a natural curiosity, which is, well, if the purpose of life is to live, how should I live? Yeah. <laughs> and and to, to make decisions about how you should live, it's necessary to understand the quality of your own being. Yeah. In other words, to understand yourself with greater clarity so you can see what you need to create. For example, let's say um, in, you've got five different relationships. In one minute, you're going to create patience for the, towards this person. Next minute, you, you're going to create compassion towards this person. Next minute, you're going to create forgiveness towards this person. And so you're going to be, in that moment, compassion. You're going to be forgiveness. You're going to be, in other words, that's what you're expressing. That's what the highest state of consciousness you're creating in your relationship with that person. And as you do that, as you create and give that to whatever relationship that you find yourself faced with, then you notice the quality, that that is the highest quality that I can create my life at in that moment. You know, it would be nice if it was all fixed and just straight through and we can just create one quality of being and then it's just no because life has a variety different people different relationships different situations sometimes it's called the dance of life in, in india it's called lila or play it, it's like as if we're in a play and so we get to play in other words when kids are playing they're incredibly creative so when we see life as a play as an opportunity to play we become quite creative and then the quality of our creativity becomes deeper and deeper and deeper. You know? But as long as you believe that they, <laughs> we're back again, they're responsible for how I feel. In other words, the quality of the creation that I'm feeling now, as long as I believe it's them, then I'm not taking responsibility. I'm not being fully creative in myself. I'm not living my life to its full potential. And, and so many books, many speakers, many, many ways to approach this. Why am I here? You know, it's multidimensional. And, uh, and, and so I would recommend you take the time out to, to research, to search for clarity. And, and it must take you inside yourself must bring you back to you. So four levels of relaxation, the physical, the mental, the emotional, and what I call the, the level of the heart, because that's what we're talking about here, is the heart of, of, of ourselves. Yeah, our natural feelings. What are our natural, what are your natural feelings from the heart? Emotions are unnatural. They are disturbance. They're wasting our energy. They're flaring outwards and then they come back in 
And what's my natural feeling on the inside? So the physical, the mental, the emotional, and some people say the heart, other people call it the spiritual or the territory of consciousness. These are the four levels at which we can, and some would say we need, to find our own relaxed, most relaxed state. And that's the challenge of sometimes called the spiritual journey. So I'm going to stop talking now, and uh, that's enough for me. That's far too much for me, too many ideas. And uh, let's see if there's any questions, um, uh, uh, if anyone has any questions. Um, just checking in with the chat page here, and I see absolutely no questions. <laughs> <laughs> so if anyone would like to ask a question feel free to to um to put it up on the chat page and i'm very happy to if anything anyone would want to say or share anything or you disagree with anything that i've said uh once again you can you can put that up there i can't believe that, that if i'm talking to to italy um although there aren't that many participants i can't believe you're so shy, you would not um, say something. <laughs> there are questions in Italian. Okay. So then, uh, uh, why, that's James, uh, this is to everyone. James, would you be interested in translating um, any Italian questions and then um, placing them in, in English? And at least they would provide some clues as to, to where I need to go. Mike, uh, yep. can you hear me? There's a question from the Italian group. There's 64 people oh, okay. in the Italian group. And uh, they say, when uh, will we be publishing in Italian your book, Being Yourself? <laughs> I don't know. You'd have to ask, um, I think, Antonella about that. She's uh, in charge of the, the translation. It's kind of holding in translation that's um i don't know if it's finished or not um but you'd need to ask her for an update on that one day i'm sure it's good someone's raised their hand dominique rosas has raised their hand so dominique uh, yeah hello good afternoon uh, it's been very nice to to listen to you um very very interesting and uh, uh, i really enjoyed your sense of humor <laughs> um i don't have questions at the moment because i think i will need to to really think about everything i've learned today and maybe that will come afterwards maybe through okay. uh, Rada. <laughs> but um uh, i found very interesting the 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 definition of attachment and the idea that um, uh, something gets two images so the real image the physical image and the um, the, the image i have in my mind so the way i am I identify myself to the to the to the object to the thing or to the person so i found it very interesting and i think remember um, remembering that can help you know because it's uh, yeah. it's uh, yeah very helpful and thank you for the five steps uh, to restore relaxation uh, that will be very very useful okay, fantastic yeah thank you very much thanks for thank your feedback you. dominique and just one thing that you were mentioning there is this humor I, i'm not sure if any of you are aware but but humor um is based in two words it's hue h u is, is a word for god in, in some languages in some cultures and then Moor, I think, originates in amour, love. So God is love, love is God. And so humor, pure humor, not sarcastic humor, not a humor that attacks, not, but just this pure humor, which I think is a, an innocent form of happiness in human consciousness. Pure humor is where we're all returning to. We're all returning to that natural state of being. Yeah. And <laughs> so... I'm just looking at some questions coming up here now. Um, well, what's tell in relation to believe that happiness in this world does not exist? What do you tell to someone who believes that happiness does not exist? Actually, you don't tell them anything. 
<laughs> the, the secret is to demonstrate you know, your own happiness, your own natural contentment. It's not, happiness is not, oh my God, I'm so happy, I'm so happy. Oh, my team has scored, I'm so happy. I'm, I, this is when happiness is, is, is um, confused with excitement and it's confused with pleasure. And so it's about what is true happiness for a human being. And sometimes it's called fulfillment or satisfaction. Or for me, it's the deepest happiness is just to be content within myself. And so if you can demonstrate that self-contentment to that person, this might arouse, it doesn't matter if it doesn't, but if it might arouse their curiosity and they say, are you okay? I notice you're, you, you, you're, you don't get upset and, and, and you're not up and down. See, are you different? <laughs> yeah. And so well, what is it? And then when they ask you, they're open. And that openness is an opportunity. It's an invitation really to, to share with them you know, your, your journey, your, your understanding of what happiness is. But don't worry if they don't get it. Don't worry if they don't want to get it. That's okay. That's fine. It's really, now is the time to really understand deeply for ourselves, not yes. to worry too much about others. There are also some more questions in the Italian group. Yep. Whenever you're ready. Yep. I've got questions on the chat page here. Okay, what do you do then? Just speak up a little bit. Oh, sorry. There are also some questions in the Italian group. Okay. Are you going so, to um, translate for me? Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. So one is, um, can you say a few words? Uh, okay. Right. Okay. On this special moment of the conference is where, okay, we'll skip that one. But um, how can you avoid provocations and not react emotionally? <laughs> and can we, uh, can we change our emotions? Uh, yeah. And this is a great step, a big step. Is that okay? Did you understand? Yeah, yeah got that. That's good. Thank you very much, uh, Radha. Uh, when someone tries to provoke you and you're a, you're aware that they're i mean there's there's some provocations which is not it doesn't carry the intention to provoke you and there's some provocations which carry the intention they know that they're going to press your button and you're going to react uh, <laughs> so if something is provoking you and it's not intended by the other to provoke you then it's time to look inside oneself and to see what it is that I'm attached to. If I'm reacting emotionally, it means I'm attached to something. You know, it happens in arguments, you know, and it is, is that you have an, a, an argument, it means you have an opinion, it means you're attached to a belief which you're prepared to fight for and try and make the other as right as you. I'm right, you're wrong. And so this is why you argue. And you notice the emotion? I notice the emotion is a little bit of anger, a little bit of fear, a little mixture of the two. And so I'm arguing because as soon as I hear their belief, it's a threat to my belief, which I might attach to and therefore I'm identifying with. So I'm taking their belief personally. And so, oh, oh now I'm aware of what am I doing? I'm making myself suffer. And so well, well, they're entitled to their belief. So how to disarm someone in a second? Oh, that's interesting. That's it. I never saw it that way. I have a different point of view. Okay, coffee tomorrow. See you later. Yeah, coffee tomorrow, 10 o'clock. Great, fine. And so you don't lose the plot. You don't become emotionally upset. So the second kind of provocation, and, and of course that you're going to encounter that all the time if you're really interested in, in, um, in self-understanding. You're going to encounter that situation when people press your buttons all the time. And that's part of the process. Uh, the process of becoming more aware but then there's the person who's trying to provoke you deliberately and yeah, so they know where your buttons are you know, they know how to set you off they know how to 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 trigger your emotional state and in that they feel as if when you do they feel as if ah i've got power they don't think that but i've got power over you children are very good at doing this with their parents they do exactly what the parent doesn't like and, and the parent, oh, my God, well, you don't do that. And then the child does it. It's called mischievousness. And it's as if they're provoking the parent. 
So, so it's necessary. This is why meditation becomes necessary to be able to go inside and find your power. Yeah, and to find your true energy, not the energy of your physical body, but the energy of your being. Yeah, and when you find that power, that powerfulness, then you're able to tolerate uh, and you translate it into being able to tolerate whatever people do, whatever people say. They can insult me. They can, they can criticize me. But it doesn't bother me. I know who I am. I found who I am on the inside. I find my power. So whatever they say doesn't bother me. So that takes a little bit of time, a little bit of practice. Yeah, sometimes it, it calls, it's called standing in your self-respect except that you can't respect yourself. You just have this knowingness that I'm strong enough. I have the strength, the inner strength, not the physical strength, but the inner strength to be able to tolerate whatever is thrown at me, whatever situation, words, insults, whatever comes to me. Yes. And so, so that just takes a little bit of practice and that's why it's necessary to come back to the center uh, regularly in, in your meditation or your contemplations. And then the third, the third, answer to the question is that when someone's throwing criticism or what we'd, we would call negativity at you, then you just remember that they are making themselves suffer first and they're projecting that suffering onto you. Yeah, and, so, and, and so when someone is trying to upset you, it means they're upset on the inside and they're trying to project that onto you to get them to get you to be upset too yeah and so if you understand they're making themselves suffer oh okay so instead of being defensive and condemning them for doing that can you turn your energy into understanding and compassion yeah that's the shift yeah and so so when you understand and you have compassion whatever they do doesn't bother you they know that they will benefit from the energy you're able to give to them to help them calm down to help them come out of their suffering to help them come out of their negativity so that's a little bit further down the road <laughs> but it's possible and that's where i want to get to eventually to be strong enough to tolerate and then to be able to to, to be compassionate in return So you're introducing a new definition for categorizing thoughts. No more negative, positive, but relaxed versus unrelaxed. I will experiment this. Protect. Okay. Tell me more often on the emotion. See if it becomes simple detection. Okay. Uh, I have difficulty understanding how love translates into fear. Okay. Yeah, that's a that's a good one actually. And in you know, um, there's a, a a belief that that sort of tends to be quite prevalent in most uh, spiritual circles is this idea that I have to love myself, that, that, that you can't love anyone else until you love yourself. Now, it, it's actually not possible to love yourself. I love myself. And now, which one is me? Am I two or just me? <laughs> or three? I, self and me. No, there's just one. There's one me. Yeah, and so it's impossible to love yourself. To, to, there's no subject and object in the self. There is just the self. And at least once a year, you go to a department store, you buy a beautiful gift, and you give it to someone, and you say, this is from me to you with love. Now, where did that love come from? It didn't come from the department store. That's where you got the gift. It's not in the wrapping. It's not in the bag. It came from you. So in that moment, when you gave the gift, want nothing in return, in that moment, the energy of you, which you feel, is love. And so what is love? Love is what I am. So when you are being in that state, that loving state, the last thing you're thinking, I need to love myself. <laughs> you're it. It is you. <laughs> And so it's just a word that describes your highest state of consciousness. And the highest state of consciousness is sometimes called selflessness. Yeah, and in other words, you're not concerned about getting anything in return, about having your desire satisfied, but you're here 
to meet the needs of others, to satisfy others. Mothers and babies are the closest you kind of get to this. And, you know, the mother will sacrifice everything. She'll give everything. She'll be there and she'll, she'll just give, 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 give to this innocent young child for so long. <laughs> so the child puts it on its first pair of trousers and then like, you should do what I say. And then the love disappears. But anyway, it, this is our highest state of consciousness when we're in a loving state. Now, when you're in your loving state, you'll notice you're free inside. You're free. You don't want anything in return. There's no worry that you're not going to get what you want because you don't want anything. There's no anxiety that you're going to lose anything because you're not attached to anything on the inside. You're just giving selflessly your energy, the energy of your consciousness through your form, through your behavior. But as soon as you become attached to something, as soon as you want something, you've already got it. I want the new car, I've already got it, it's in my mind. So I'm losing all, I'm driving my new car in my imagination, in my mind. And then I'm fearing that I won't get it in reality in the garage, in the driveway. I'm fearing, and so I'm fearing that it won't happen. Sometimes we get this with, with, oh, I've got an interview tomorrow, oh, I'm not gonna get the job. Oh, I'm sure I'm not gonna get, I hope I don't get the job. I, I haven't even got the job yet, and I fear losing it. I haven't got the job yet, but I'm already attached to the job, the idea of the job in my mind, in my mind. And so the energy that started out as the pure, free, highest vibration, radiant energy of self, consciousness, started out, but it got blocked. It's been blocked on its way out into the world, into relationship, is blocked by, that's mine, this is mine, my job, my car. And so it's blocked, I've got to hold on to that. And so the vibration comes down. And as the vibration comes down, it, it, it changes. It's pulled down. It changes into what we call fear. We feel fear, anxiety, worry, tension, panic. They're all different forms of fear. And we feel that. And then we say, oh, I'm so anxious. I'm not loving when I'm anxious. I'm not loving when I'm worried. I'm not loving when I'm in panic. And so it's because the energy of my consciousness has come down and I'm feeling it. So love becomes fear when you put attachment in the mind, in the way, in between. So that's as best I can explain it. Now see for yourself, <laughs> test that hypothesis, that idea, that theory for yourself. See if you can see for yourself. One of the toughest things to change is the pattern of being, even slightly irritated by some people's behaviors. I know we have become totally benevolent towards all, to, to have to become totally benevolent towards all and practice equanimity. But what's the key to achieve this stage? <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, in, in simple terms, um, the, the, the stage I have to, don't have to, but the stage I'm going to be aiming for is, is the stage of desirelessness. Yeah. Irritation, when you get irritated with someone, is they're not doing what I want. So this is where anger comes from. It's someone's not doing, not being, not giving me what I want. I get very angry. And so irritation is an early form of anger. So I get irritated with someone because they're not doing what I want. They're not laying the table the way I want. and They're, they're not driving the way I believe they should and therefore I want. <laughs> and so... It's because I want something. I desire something. You know, and, and so what, yeah, well, God, blimey, there's a challenge, isn't it? To live a life without desire. Yeah. Wow. I mean, this is not new. This is ancient wisdom. But you'll begin to join the dots and you'll see your irritability is coming from your own consciousness because you've got an idea of what they should give, should be, should be doing in your presence for you. So you begin to see it in you. And so now, let it go. They're just doing what they're doing. He's doing what he's doing. She's doing what she's doing. Let them live their life. Allow them to be. There's a lovely piece of philosophy or code for living called desiderata. 
and you can Google it, Desiderata. And in Desiderata, it's got this lovely piece of wisdom and, and which is easy to speak, but challenging to put into practice. And that is to accept that whatever is happening in the world is what is meant to be happening in this moment now, which is always in the past. It's always in the moment just gone. <laughs> So acceptance is, is a secret, yeah? And everyone is doing what they are meant to be doing right now. <laughs> so it's also one second later, it's always a second later. So it's always in the past. So I always accept what has happened, what people have done, what events have occurred. I'm just accepting, that's all. I'm just accepting of everything. And so if you accept everything, then you don't become irritable. You know, now acceptance, so don't be careful, it doesn't mean I agree with everything you have said. It doesn't mean I condone everything you've done. Yeah. <laughs> but I accept it's in the past, can't change it. And so that acceptance helps me to not be so emotionally upset, what you call irritability. It's an emotion, early form of anger. And the final answer is, um, and, and, and it, it's a little bit challenging again, you know, when you go to the theater and you watch a play or you watch a movie, you know, and you see the characters doing what they're doing. And of course they're designed to do what they're doing to trigger your emotions, to trigger your anger or irritability. In other words, they're designed for you to lose your sense of self in what they're doing. Yeah, they're designed to suck you in. It's getting sucked into the story. So as you get sucked into the story, it's as if they have power over you. And that's why we go to the theater. We go to, to be sucked in and, and to escape from our self. And so we surrender our consciousness. Yeah. But at the same time, in the back of our consciousness, we know it's just a play. It's just a movie. We don't take it too seriously. <laughs> there might be a moment when you get very upset with what they're doing and then oh wait a minute it's just a movie oh it's just a play what I was doing wow and some people are looking at me and they go what's the matter with you you got you're so easily sucked in yeah you're right I am actually and so when you stop allowing yourself to be sucked in when you can realize it's just a play it's just a movie don't be exploited by it just stand back and you begin to realize the characters are just playing their roles and so everyone's just playing a role. Everyone is just an actor playing their role. And of course, the big stage is the stage of life. There's that word play again. Wow, we're just here to play. Yeah, but of course we take it so seriously. Why do we take it so seriously? Behind seriousness is fear. And behind fear is always attachment or anger. Oh, I don't like what they're doing. I don't like the way they're acting. That's not acceptable. I'm very upset. That's not acceptable. And so we make ourselves upset <laughs> by our non-acceptance because we are attached to how they should do it, how they should play, how they should act. Do you see? And so Hollywood has got a lot to answer for. <laughs> but when you see all this, you set yourself free. You know, everyone's just playing. Everyone's doing what they're meant to be doing. Everyone in the world. But if you're thinking from a material standpoint, that's, that's quite challenging. It's quite, it's quite difficult to implement. What's the difference between mind, knowledge, and consciousness? <laughs> okay, it's probably the final question. Yeah. Um, mind is like a screen. It's like, um, uh, you know, like a painter as a canvas or a flip chart with a blank page on it. It's like you can put anything in your mind. You can run any story. You, know? you can run any um, ideas. You can put five ideas up on the screen. That's what we do when we're being creative. Well, what, how, what, how could we solve this problem? Here's five ideas. You know? And then we use our intellect to assess the quality of each of those ideas, which is another way of using our consciousness to assess, to evaluate. That's what makes us different from the birds and the bees, the flowers and the trees. They don't have that capability we have this to discern what's a good quality idea knowledge 
is when you've realized, you know, you, you know what an emotion is. Let's take an emotion for example. When you know that when you create emotion, it's because you are attached to something in your consciousness. So you know that right now. Sorry, right now you probably just believe that. But as soon as you see for yourself, then you can say you know. Yeah. No. Everything I've said to you, you already know in, in one sense, but you've forgotten. In other words, it's outside of your awareness, outside of your moment by moment awareness. And that's why we have something called, in English anyway, intuition. Intuition is this feeling, this subtle feeling that comes from deep within your consciousness. And sometimes I call it a sense of knowingness. I'm going this way, not that way. Mike, you, you, you say, Mike, why are you going this way, not that way? I say, I don't, don't have a reason, don't have a rationale, but I just kind of know intuitively this is the right way to do it. This is the right thing to do, the right thing to do. So it's like a knowingness. And that lives within each one of us, that knowingness. Yeah. So you have blind faith, which is faith based on belief. And then you have an enlightened faith based on a knowingness. Yeah. In other words, that knowingness is your intuition, which is subtle feelings. Emotions are triggered by thoughts. Feelings trigger thoughts. Feelings find their form in thoughts. In other words, when you become emotional, someone has said something and you think, oh my God, and then you get the emotion. Whereas when you're tapping into your intuition, it starts as a feeling, this wave of energy. Don't know why, but then the feeling becomes a thought. So in other words, this wave of energy, let's call it love, and then the thought occurs, how could I care for that person? So you start looking at different ideas of expressing that caring. You know, and, and so it started out as this very subtle feeling, then very powerful feeling, and then it became a thought and into behavior. You know, whereas when you're emotional, something triggers. And what's triggering is your thinking. Your thinking is triggering. The emotional disturbance and you begin to see this for yourself if you practice some kind of introspection meditation contemplation and all of this is taking place in your consciousness consciousness is what i am and, and if that's the, the the neat way to, to finish <laughs> yeah this, this consciousness is what's talking to you now i'm using my form to my consciousness me i to talk to you right now yeah <laughs> everyone is a being of consciousness yeah but then how conscious are we how aware are we then you go into the idea of awareness not very aware you're not very they're not very aware everyone's consciousness but they're not very aware why are they not aware because of attachment i'm my awareness is blocked i can't see clearly i can't be aware with clarity in my consciousness that's another seminar. Let's finish with a few moments of quietness together and maybe just a, a short meditation to tie a ribbon around those ideas. And so I'm going to ask you to um, look away from the screen, maybe, and uh, because if you watch me, then you just see movement and you start going into evaluation and what's that and what's this. So if you rest your eyes somewhere to the side of the screen, you can close your eyes if you like. And then just let your gaze rest there. You'll go beyond what you're seeing because your attention is going to come more and more within yourself. So just relax your body. Level one, relaxing my body in the chair. Take the shape of your chair. Any tension you find throughout your body, just let that tension go and then relax. And then bring your awareness 
through your breath and just watch your breath. It just brings your attention away from the world, away from your body, away, just to observe your breath. Don't force, just watch. Witness the full cycle of your breathing. And as you do, you'll become even more relaxed. And bring your awareness to yourself. See if you can be aware of yourself being aware. So then within your awareness, create one thought in your mind. I am a being of peace. I am a being of peace. Let that thought roll across the screen of your mind, but very slowly. And then let that thought go. Let it dissolve into the background and notice what remains. There's a feeling of peace. So now the mind is quiet, relaxed, silent. And I feel calm and yet very aware. Aware that there is a stillness here at the heart of my being. Silent and still. Silent and still. So then bring your awareness back, back into the room around you, but bring that stillness with you, bring that calm. So as you listen through these ears, listen from that stillness. As you look through these eyes, see from that stillness. Good. So thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you for playing. Thanks for your questions, your comments. There's a lot of questions there now. And so uh, <clears throat> I hope there's something you can take away. And, um, <laughs> and I think Radha, the final word is for you. Yes. So my thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart, I think on behalf of everyone. <laughs> And uh, really, the clarity that you have and that you share with us is really 
I think it's a big, big gift. So everyone, I think a lot of people appreciate the way you share and what you share. So thank you for your practice. Thanks very much. So thanks once again and uh, good luck on the journey and good luck on your travels. And see you next time.